Okay, I'm Sarah Jane Blakemore from uh, University College London. And today I want to be talking a bit about um, the adolescent brain, which is the focus of my lab's research. And I'm going to talk a bit about the history of this very young area of science. And I'll also tell you about some of the kind of current and questions for the future in this area. Okay, so a bit of history. Um, I did my PhD on schizophrenia, and I also did a postdoc on schizophrenia. And I became interested in the fact that schizophrenia is a very devastating psychiatric disease that has its onset right at the end of adolescence. So normally people develop schizophrenia on average between about 18 and 25 years. So this is really interesting because it's a developmental disorder. It develops, but it develops much later than most developmental disorders. So I became interested in whether that might be something to do with um, brain development during the teenage years going wrong in people who go on to develop schizophrenia. So this was about 12 years ago or so. And back then, I delved into the literature. And to my surprise, there was very little known about how the, teen the human teenage brain develops. There were a handful of studies back in the year, I don't know, 2002 this was or something. There were a handful of studies, only a small handful. But they were really intriguing because even though there were only a few of them, they all pointed to really significant and very protracted development of the brain right throughout adolescence and into the 20s. Now, this was really um, interesting finding because prior to those papers, most people, most neuroscientists would have assumed that the, um, and the, really the dogma at the time, and when I was an undergraduate and a graduate, was that the human brain stops developing sometime in childhood and really doesn't change very much after, say, mid to late childhood. But what these papers suggested was that that dogma was completely wrong. And in fact, the human brain continues to develop very significantly across almost the whole cortex um, throughout the teenage years and even into the 20s. So this was an intriguing finding, but it also uh, pointed to a massive gap in the field. Very, there were very few uh, papers, very little was known, and there were so many questions that had yet to be uh, uh, answered. So I decided back then, so this again was in the about year 2002, 2003, to change the focus of my research from, um, uh, from adult studies on schizophrenia and other uh, mental illnesses to developmental studies. And I want to say at this point that 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 was actually, in retrospect, I look back and I think, God, that was actually quite a risky manoeuvre because I'd never done a developmental study before. And it was really with the encouragement of my friend and mentor, um, Uta Frith, that I was able to you know, have the confidence to make that change. And also with a fellowship from the Royal Society, which allowed me to take this relatively risky avenue. So in the last 12 or 15 years, a huge amount has been discovered about the development of the human brain throughout the teenage years. Many labs now work in this area and there's been a, an explosion of research that is still really rapidly expanding. And we know really quite a lot about development of the adolescent brain now. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about that today and a bit about the kinds of questions that still remain because there are very many. Um, most of the work has been uh, done with structural imaging. so. Um, structural MRI, that, that, that really is the method that has kind of changed the game in this area of research because before we were, before we were able to scan the living human brain with MRI, we weren't able to understand how the brain changes across development. But now we can, we can scan, scan kids of all ages as long as they keep still, which is not always the case. Um, we're able to look at uh, changes in brain structure and also changes in brain function across the lifespan. Um, so it's really with that, it was really that technology that uh, was the kind of turning point in our understanding of the development of the brain. But also there's a huge, now there's a huge amount of behavioral studies, so experimental behavioral studies on um, cognitive and socio-effective changes during the teenage years. So um, uh, in my lab, we're particularly interested in adolescent typical behaviors. So what I mean by that are behaviours that you stereotypically associate with teenagers, things like risk-taking and heightened self-consciousness and peer influence. So we're really interested in those behaviours. Um, 
there's, there's a nice, there are quite a lot of nice examples of these behaviours, and I'm going to read one. Uh, th this is a letter that was written to the Guardian newspaper, which is a British newspaper, a couple of years ago. So this, this is a, a reader who says, there's nothing like teenage diaries for putting momentous historical occasions into perspective. This is my entry for the 20th of July, 1969. Went to art centre in yellow cords and blouse. Ian was there, but he didn't speak to me. Got rhyme put in my handbag by someone who's apparently got a crush on me. It's Nicholas, I think. Ugh, man landed on moon. <laughs> 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 the reason why that letter is really nice is because it illustrates what's really important to that girl at that particular moment in her life. Less important than man landed on moon than things like, you know, what she was wearing, what, she, what clothes she was into, who she liked, who she didn't like. This is the period of life where that kind of sense of self and particularly sense of social self mm -hmm. undergoes really profound transition. Just think back about when you were a teenager. It's not that before then you don't have a sense of self. Of course, you do a uh, sense of self develops very, very early. But what happens during the teenage years is that your sense of who you are, your moral beliefs, uh, your political beliefs, what music you're into, fashion, what, what uh, social group you're into, that's what really go undergoes profound change. And that's what we're really interested in. <clears throat> we're particularly interested in the effects that peers have on adolescent decision making. So it's really well known that, okay, risk taking in adolescence. Yeah, adolescents do take risks and they probably take a disproportionate number of risks. However, if you give them a kind of optimal situation, an optimal environment, they don't actually take more risks. If they're in a lab and there's no distractions, there's no kind of emotionally motivational salient factors going on, they don't take, they, they perform really well, just as well as adults, and they take about the same number of risks, depending on what task you use. But when you give them some kind of motivational context, for example, a couple of friends standing behind them or something like that, when they're with their peers, that's when you see heightened risk-taking in adolescence. And you don't just see it in the lab. We all know from kind of epidemiological data and data from uh, car insurance companies that that's exactly, that's, that's borne out in real life as well. A adolescents, for example, have more car accidents than older people, but the situation in which they have those car accidents is normally when they have a same aged passenger in the car with them. So we're really interested in why adolescents are particularly susceptible to uh, peer influence. And one of the ways we've looked at this is to look at what, what happens when um, adolescents are um, ostracised by their peer group. So we've done this by using the pretty well-known game called Cyberball, which is a game that you play, a kind of game of catch, like a ball game that you play over the internet with what you think are two other people. In fact, they're not, they're programmed by the lab. <clears throat> and you can program those two other players to either include you in this ball game or exclude you. <clears throat> from the ball game. Now, when you do this um, with adults, when adults play the cyber ball game, when they've been excluded from that game of catch, they feel sad, their mood lowers, they feel more anxious, um, and you can, you can measure that, and many, this has been done many times by lots of labs around the world. And what we did was we uh, compared adolescents and adults in this kind of cyber ball game, and we found that exactly the same response was found but even more so in adolescents. So adolescents felt uh, that their, their mood dropped even more than adults' mood did, and they became even more anxious than adults did after being excluded from this game. So that suggested that adolescents might be hypersensitive to being socially excluded. And when you think about that in the context of adolescent decision-making, it kind of sheds adolescent decision-making and risk-taking in a much more rational light. So. Um, if you think about whenever you make a decision, you weigh, up, you weigh up various pros and cons, various advantages and disadvantages of something like, I don't know, speeding down the motorway or texting while driving. You might think, well, you know, I'm going to get to my meeting on time if I speed. You might get a kick out of speeding. On the other hand, you might crash. You might get caught by the police. You're weighing up these pros and cons, but there's also the social factor. We know that uh, we behave differently in groups compared with when we're on our own and having, some other, having someone else observe your uh, behaviour changes your behaviour on cognitive tasks. And what we think is happening is that in adolescence that uh, social influence is particularly heightened. This is a framework that my student Kate Mills and I have been working on recently. When you think about that framework, um, 
if you, if you take, for example, smoking, say, say you have a 13-year-old girl and all her friends are smoking. For her, what is the more risky decision? Saying yes to a cigarette when she knows that you know, the risks associated with smoking, as all 13-year-olds do these days, or saying no and potentially ostracizing herself from her peer group. Uh, we think that because of the hypersensitivity to being ostracized by the peer group, that saying no is actually probably more of a risk for adolescents. So at this point, I wanted to say that um, one of the things that is coming out of adolescent uh, studies at the moment is this idea that these, these stereotypical behaviours that we associate with adolescents, like risk-taking and peer influence, are there for a reason. There's probably a really good reason why adolescents are, uh, care so much about being included by their social group and, and take more risks when they're with their friends. And I mean, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but it makes sense when you think about um, the need, the drive to become independent from one's parents, to go and explore the environment and to affiliate with your social group during this period of life. So it, one thing I'm not saying is that this is a bad thing, you know, that risk taking is bad and that peer influence is bad. It's probably a really important and adaptive process that we all need to go through in our transition between childhood and adulthood. So one of the uh, questions that we've been interested in looking at as well is why why is it that why and how is it that social influence has its effect on decision making and behavior in adolescence and there are lots of theories about why this is and i'm not going to go into any detail but just to mention that uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we're interested in is the development of the social brain and what i mean by that is the brain regions that are involved in when we when we when we do theory of mind so when we think about other people's minds their intentions their beliefs their desires their emotions uh, there is a circumscribed network of brain regions that are activated when we do when we do a mentalizing task, and what uh, various labs around the world have found is that th that network of brain regions undergoes very significant development, both in terms of structure, so in terms of grey matter and white matter development, and also in terms of function during adolescence. Uh, specifically, quite a number of labs now have replicated the effect that a certain region of the uh, social brain called the medial prefrontal cortex is more active in adolescents than in adults when thinking about uh, other people's minds. Even though adolescents and adults in these studies have been just as good at the mentalizing task, they use a different level of activity in medial prefrontal cortex in order to do so. And again, we don't really know why this is, but we think it might have something to do with the kind of cognitive strategy or the mental approach to the problem. The way they, the way they solve these problems might require different levels of activity in, in, this, in the regions of the social brain network. But the development of the social brain during adolescence suggests that maybe this period of life, the, maybe during this period of life, the brain is particularly susceptible to social pressure, but also to the social experiences that adolescents um, are, 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 um, have around them and the kind of social opportunities that are given to them. And this brings me on to one of, the one of the major questions. There are many, many questions that still remain to be looked at in this area, but one of them is, whether adolescence represents a sensitive period for brain development. Now, a lot of people, you'll hear a lot of people talking about adolescence as representing a, se a second sensitive period of brain development, but actually we don't have very much data on that. So we know from uh, studies on early development of the brain, both from humans and non-human animals, that the brain undergoes lots of different critical periods, or we now usually use the term sensitive periods, of development, meaning that there are certain periods of development where the brain is particularly susceptible to certain types of environmental stimuli. We know lots about this in domains such as sensory input and also language input in the first few years of life, just to name a couple of examples. Now, given that the brain is undergoing a lot of development during adolescence, particularly in areas like prefrontal cortex and other cortical areas, Many people have suggested that this might represent a kind of window of opportunity, a second sensitive period for learning uh, in, in sort of cognitive and social domains. And actually, there is very little evidence on this yet. It makes a lot of sense, but it's still a really open question. And it's something that we and other labs around the world are currently looking at. But again, there's not really much to say about it yet because there's, there are a couple of studies suggesting it might be in some domains. But it really has... Um, if, if it's true that adolescence represents a sensitive period of brain development in some areas of cognition and social behaviour, 
then that has implications for things like education, like when to teach what, what's the best moment to teach calculus or algebra or something. Uh, it also has implications for the social environment, should adolescents be uh, experiencing certain types of social, um, so social interaction experiences. Uh, during, during that period of life, I think it has implications for things like also the legal treatment of teenagers. I mean, at the moment, if teenagers do something really naughty, they are incarcerated with other teenagers who've done something really naughty, and yet we know <laughs> that they're particularly susceptible to peer influences. It's really the most rational thing to do. Uh, it's probably not a particularly productive um, s solution. Okay, so if, the, if adolescence is a, is, a is a sensitive period for brain development, that is a kind of double edged, double-sided coin, because although it um, represents a period of opportunity where the brain is particularly susceptible possibly to acquiring new information in certain domains, it also might represent a period of vulnerability where the brain is particularly vulnerable to certain environmental inputs. Um, we know, so, so far I've been very briefly talking about, in no detail at all, talking about average teenage brains. This is all the data that we have, or most of the data we have, is averaging out teenage brains. But there is no average teenage brain. There's no average teenager. The individual differences are much, much greater than the averages. Um, and we, we're only just starting to look at individual differences and how individual differences in both genetics and environment influence brain development. But we, we know that they both do. We know that d genetics, your, your genotype, and also your environment influence um, influence your brain development. So environmental influences are so huge, they're almost infinite and very difficult to study actually, but um, they're things like, I don't know, stress, alcohol, drugs, um, your social group, your family environment, your culture, your peers, who you hang out with, all these things invariably will be shaping the way the adolescent brain is developing. And they also might play an influence in, in triggering the onset of mental illnesses in people who are genetically predisposed to them. So now going back to where I began, mental illness, um, it's not just schizophrenia that has its onset at this, during this period of life. It's also many other mental illnesses. Most mental illnesses like depression, anxiety, eating disorders, addictions have their onset during at some point during adolescence. So there's something about adolescence which means this period of life is a, is a window of sort of vulnerability to these, to these, um, to these illnesses. Um, I haven't myself done any work on, so my aim, you know, 12 years ago was to map out the development of the adolescent brain and then move on to um, brain development in teenagers who become, schiz become schizophrenic. And I have, you know, I have just made such a tiny input <laughs> into the former that there's no way I'm anywhere near doing any work on schizophrenia yet. But other labs around the world have started to do that. They've started to, like I, I mentioned the NIH study particularly, and, and there are lots of labs, but I, I have a collaboration with Jay Geed at the NIH and his, uh, he was one of the pioneers of this area and they have done research on uh, longitudinal studies looking at brain development in, in kids who then go on to develop some kind of mental illness or developmental disorder. And rather than summarizing the data, the data is quite new, it needs to be replicated, um, it, it, it's really interesting but it's quite varied. The, I think the one take home message is that it is really critical to look at development in these disorders. So rather than taking a kind of snapshot of what the brain looks like in a, say, 18-year-old with depression compared to 18-year-olds who don't have depression, the brain actually might look quite similar by that age, but what seems to be from, from this, what the research points to is that what's really critical is the way it gets there and that there can be different developmental trajectories that end up at more or less the same point. And the, the analogy I'd give is like, you know, you might use the, um, the motorways, the freeways or the A roads to get to the, ending up at the same point, but you take a very different route to get there. And that seems to be what's really critical in a lot of these developmental disorders and mental illnesses. So looking at development and not just taking a snapshot in time is really important. Finally, um, almost finally, I wanted to talk about prevention of mental illness because like I said, you know, adolescence might give us a kind of window of opportunity, not just for things like education and learning, but also for intervention. So it used to be, um, oh well, there's a, there's a real dogma in, in social policy and educational policy that um, the first three years of life are really the critical window where you have to kind of get in and intervene. 
But actually, what this research on the brain is suggesting is that the brain continues to develop, is perhaps undergoes heightened plasticity or is heightened, um, it is plastic but in a heightened way right throughout the teenage years. So that it's not too late during the teenage years to intervene in the case where people might need some kind of extra help. Um, one of the way, one of the interventions that uh, is really important is an intervention that prevents or at least reduces the onset of mental illness in people who are susceptible to it. Um, and that, that's something that a lot of people are thinking about at the moment. How do you do that? Are there kind of, is, you know, is a universal approach better than a targeted approach? And uh, one of the areas that we are about to uh, start working on is looking at whether uh, mindfulness meditation as a universal treatment in schools has any effect on well-being and lower, lowering anxiety and stress, but also reducing the onset of mental illness in teenagers, but I can't tell you any, I mean, there is some really um, promising data on that from other people's labs, but we, we haven't begun our studies on that yet, but we're about to next year. Okay, so finally, and this really is the end, um, one of the things that I have kind of learned over the last 10 or 12 years of researching uh, in this area is that it's really critical to, in to include your research subjects in every aspect of your experimental design. And this is not something I'd done previously, but um, there's a kind of tendency of adults to think that they know best for teenagers, when actually teenagers know probably a lot more than we do about what's best for them in terms of their education, in terms of their kind of social environment, what they want to do and that kind of thing. But it also applies to um, experiments as well. So these days we always include teenagers in the designs of our experiments, the designs of our stimuli. And I'll give you a, a, a couple of just really trivial examples where that's really helped. Well, firstly, uh, talking to teenagers about actual phenomena that they experience has led us to design experiments or apply for grants to, to research those phenomena. And we probably wouldn't have remembered what it was like uh, when we were teenagers. And also things have changed. You know, each generation is different. So that's really useful. But also things like, oh, there was one experiment we did where um, we had we had a, stim a stimuli with like a load of objects on it, and one of those objects was a tape, like as in a cassette. And so, involving teenagers at a very early stage of our research made us realise that no teenagers know what a tape is; they don't <laughs> recognise it. <laughs> so we changed that, and and things like peer uh, peer influence. So we're really interested in peer influence, and. Uh, we found from involving teenagers in, in the designs of our studies that what really matters to them is not being observed by a peer, but having a peer monitor their behaviour. So being told that this friend of yours is going to sit behind you and actually after you've done this task, they're going to um, fill in a questionnaire about how you did. That's what really matters to them. And again, we couldn't have guessed that from the adult literature because there's no indication that that is a really significant factor in adults. Um, and and, and yes, yeah, so that, that's what we do now on the basis of suggestions by teenagers. I really like the point that you were making about how these behaviours on the part of teenagers that might seem irrational can actually be seen as rational. And then I was just wondering why that same kind of argument doesn't also apply to parents. So if you consider these kids, they're in this situation where they could do this seemingly safe thing, but or they could do the seemingly risk-seeking thing. But if you think about the, the actual risk of the safe thing, it's very great, because the risk is a reputational risk. And then you can see why uh, adolescents would evolve, you know, to yeah. do these seemingly risk-seeking things that are actually the safety because they avoid yeah. having these reputational punishments. Yeah. But why do we, as parents, <laughs> not evolve in the same way? So why is it that if we, if I saw my daughter doing a very safe thing, I wouldn't pressure her to do a more badass thing so that <laughs> she would avoid the possible reputational punishments? I'd be totally fine with that. Why is it that, as yeah. parents, we don't develop that exact same mentality of being like, you must seek the yeah, risk seeking yeah, behavior or else you're going to suffer these post punishments. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've, we're not very good at taking the perspective of people who are different from us. And um, we've forgotten how important it was to, uh, to, you know, to impress your friends or not to be ostracized by them. But if you remember back, I mean, not all teenagers are like this. And again, I want to emphasize that there are huge individual differences. Some, te some teenagers never take any risks. Some te teenagers are very... Uh, strong and aren't um, aren't susceptible to peer influence. But I bet around the room, or certainly for me, if you think back about your teenage years, 
that you know that you did take risks a lot of you and when you were with your friends not when you're on your own and now you probably wouldn't you just wouldn't i mean if if you're if your group of your colleagues or whatever all smoking cigarettes outside and they offered you one it, you wouldn't mind saying no thanks i'm not gonna i don't smoke as an adult and and it's quite easy to forget what the pressure of the social pressure of not being excluded by your group and the importance of that feels like Oh, so you're thinking about it as happening at the proximate level, not at this ultimate level. You're, it's the, the w question I was having was, why didn't we just evolve as parents to pressure our kids to um, engage in risky, risky behaviors? Well, I guess risk-taking um, has to be constrained. I mean, risk-taking is a good thing, I think. We, if we didn't take risks, where would we be? On the other hand, it also can be dangerous and can result in in accidents or even death. If you look at mortality rates across the age, um, across the lifespan, um, the number one cause of death in adolescence is from risk-taking, is from accidents, and that's not true at any other period of life. So risk-taking is a good thing unless it goes too far. So you need some constraints over risk-taking, and that's where parents come in, and that's probably very evolutionarily important as well. So sorry, I misunderstood the, the tone of your question. So, so if, if I may, so the, um, I have a quick question about the, you know, the evolutionary history of, of the thing. And I guess you, can ha you could have two texts. One is that uh, throughout our evolutionary history, there was this, this significant period of our lives during which we had to form you know, a clique to find partners, you know, sexual partners, cooperation partners. And so it was very important to, you know, as you're saying, to, to, to get along with them and to, kind of, to, to uh, give in to peer pressure. And so because it was always around the same time that that happened throughout our history, our brains have kind of taken that in and now they kind of, they kind of reflect that history. And uh, another possibility, which I mean, can both are uh, you know, evolutionarily uh, consistent, uh, would be that um, throughout our history, there had been time, times in, in people's lives in which they found themselves in these situations in which they have to make new friends or to find new partners. And that can happen when you're 40, that can happen when you're 15, that can happen at any age. And so instead of just having this maturational period at adolescence, our brains would be sort of equipped to kind of behave in the way that adolescents behave now at any, in any context in which it's the best thing to do. So, like, you, could you think of like people who are, like, you know, I don't know, conscripted in the army, or even you, you, know, you start a new job, or you know, you move to a new country, and you find yourself in a situation that is so much similar to that you know, adolescents find, find themselves in? And would you think that then they kind of revert, or you know, they they kind of uh, become more adolescent-like? I don't, I don't know of any research looking at that. It doesn't. It probably exists, but I don't know. I don't know any data. My guess would be that. Um, you know, we can. Our bra the brain is plastic throughout life, so you can change, you can revert, you can behave differently in different contexts. But the very large amount of brain development going on during adolescence, it, although it's protracted in some areas and continues right throughout the uh, 20s and 30s, it is stabilizing around then. So that I suppose if you're going to attribute these kinds of changes in behavior during adolescence to changes in brain structure and function, then those kinds of changes are not going to be as profound in adults, even if you find yourself in a situation which might demand that. Yeah, but could it be like an artifact of the fact that most of the adults we've scanned happen to have stable stable lives? But yeah. if, you, if you looked, I mean, I'm not saying I have, I have yeah. no preconceived idea about that, but maybe if you look only at adults who happen to, you know, they need to change, to change friends very often because they're moving very often or they don't have a stable partner or something. Then maybe you'd find that actually they keep being their brain keeps being kind of adolescent like for longer. Or maybe it's the other way around, and that's because why they, they yeah. maybe the if their brain is like that, that yeah. then they that drives yeah. them to. Yeah. But I have the same inverse question then, because you can imagine a seventeen-year-old who's been a kidnapped bride and now has two children and isn't going through the same peer pressure, and so would their brain show the level of stability? Then it, are there co cross-cultural studies for the different? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So there are. Um, okay, so adolescence um, is is often defined as the period of life between puberty and uh, and the end of adolescence is defined at the age at which you attain a stable, independent role in society. Now, with that definition, which actually I really like, it really works, and a lot of people use it. But with that definition, that <laughs> includes massive variations in culture between cultures, because in our culture, it's totally normal to you know be an adolescent using that definition right into the 20s, even sometimes the 30s, not feel particularly, you know, stable and independent. 
But in other cultures, like the cultures you were mentioning, um, kids are expected to become financially independent, get jobs, earn money as soon as they go through sexual maturity or even before. Uh, yeah, girls are expected to get married, have babies as soon as they can. Um, and the question is, is there any... And, and some people have argued that actually adolescence doesn't really exist. It's a kind of Western invention about 100 years ago. But actually, if you look, I think there are three reasons why that's not a completely watertight argument. Firstly, cross-cultural studies. If you look at cross-cultural studies, you can see, even in cultures that vastly differ, you can see uh, increases in risk-taking and increases in peer influence and self-consciousness in, in those different cultures. Secondly, there are studies in animals showing that even animals undergo a period of heightened risk-taking and heightened socialization. Uh, during their teenage years, well, they're adolescents, yeah, they're, they're <laughs> depending on what animal they are, they're sort of as adolescents, post-puberty. Um, and also, if you look at historical descriptions of adolescence, even from thousands of years ago, or in Shakespeare, 100 years, 400 years ago, you see really similar descriptions of, um, of, that, of this age group as the way we stereotypically describe them today as taking risks and making bad decisions and being particularly influenced by their peers and that kind of thing. So I think although, oh, I'm not saying that culture does not influence the development of the brain. Of course it does, it will. Uh, and actually not very much is known about that at all, how, how brain development looks in these different cultures. But I'm sure it'll be subtly different and you could, you could measure that. And people will measure that when they start these studies. But uh, there, there's a lot of overlap between cultures. Yeah. I've been thinking uh, a lot about changes of state in biological systems. And, you know, I, I think about uh, something like the skull. And it, it, there's so many functions contained in it. And it, yet it has to grow from, you know, a small size to something much larger over time. And it, to get all of those functions to coordinate, to, to create a change from, you know, the infant skull to, you know, a, 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 you know an older skull, it, the, the genetic architecture that, that enables that to happen without without devastating trauma is, is sort of uh, uh, mind-boggling to sort of take the full scope of. Um, and when it, and, and when it doesn't happen, it really is truly just devastating. Same same with even something like sleep. I mean, you know, go, going from a wake, waking state to a to a, a sleeping state, we think of it as sort of well, you just unplug the cord, right? But as it turns out, for anybody who's got a really but people with but people with you know chronic sleep disorders who cannot fall asleep, there's there, you know we know the brain is having there's a many many things that have to go right. And we usually take for granted that they will go right, you know, or even the assignment of sex, you know, in the entry in, the, in uh, you know uh, the the the, the, sex, the primary sex characteristics during development. So many things have to go right, and so I'm thinking about something like schizophrenia, which is one of these, de you know, it's different from lots of other mental disorders in as much as it is a truly devastating disease where, s where m evidently, apparently, many, many things that have to go right, at least one of them hasn't gone right. So if that's true, if, all, if, if that premise is true, why does it take the shape it does? You know, why does it have a set of features that are so, I mean, yes, it's a sort of a, a menu and you, 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 pick your, your, you pick your features from but but why is it, why those features and not others? And I you know so it makes me think. So how do those features so reliably come out of a developmental failure, a failure in a change of state that leads most children to another kind of sort of social social way of being in the world? Why why does this generic failure of everything to go right lead this way? And what does that tell us about the normal typical pattern of development where? Where you know yeah. where what we're trying to target, the, yeah. like the actual target is normatively. It's a totally interesting question, and actually that's really what I was interested in when I was studying schizophrenia back in the day. Um, I was interested in delusions of control and auditory hallucinations. Okay. So this is where patients think that their movements are being controlled by someone else or a machine or something, or they're hearing voices inside their head. My question wasn't really why, it was why, how come that doesn't happen for all of us? So when I move and pick up this, how do I know that that's my own movement and that was a movement caused by my intention? That's, that's amazing, how does that happen? Why doesn't that go wrong in all of us? So yeah, I did, that's, that's the, exactly the question I was really interested in, but not, not from a developmental point of view at that point, but just from a kind of phenomenological point of view and 
a and, and also mechanistic point of view like how how do we achieve that um but in terms of i mean i do think you know all these things are really on a spectrum and it yes it people with schizophrenia they there is a clear-cut set of symptoms and they are very it's very severe but actually each one of those symptoms most of us will have experienced a little bit to a tiny extent at some point you only you know you only have to look at the effects of psychotropic drugs to just push the brain over into temporary paranoia or hallucinations or whatever to see that we're all it's all a fragile state and it's not a kind of black and white um uh qualitative difference actually i think it's a quantitative difference but i think all of these things are on a spectrum and you can measure that with things like schizotypy questionnaires um, but the question is, yeah, why are some people pushed over the edge into this, well, all, sometimes permanent um, situation of constantly experiencing delusions and hallucinations and uh, that? A command, <laughs> command no. hallucinations, for example. Yeah. I mean, do, it's so tempting to try to draw a parallel between those and where the normal, typical pattern of development should take you, which is appropriate sort of approval and respect from your peers. You know, having yeah. people that you can influence and that can influence you yeah. in, in, in ways yeah. that are going to be adaptive through the rest of adulthood. Well, one, one really interesting theory of, um, of adolescence, yeah, and this is my last couple of sentences, back in the 50s by Peter Elkind, was this idea that uh, teenagers have an imaginary audience, which is that they think they're being watched and judged by other people much more than they are. Mm. Now, that is actually really similar to the state that um, people with schizophrenia describe how their life feels that they're constantly being watched and observed um, and I, do, I think you know I'm not saying that there's a overlap or there's kind of similarity but there is something that there's something that's similar and the question is how do how do most teenagers not go over the edge into paranoia thank you thanks